Hello and welcome. We're here today in Bedford at the Sensam Symposium where we've been discussing climate and the apocalypse. This afternoon we're going to be having our round table discussion discussing some of the key issues that have arisen from the conference as well as some of the key issues in the field and possible outcomes or at least questions. So around the table I have four experts who are going to introduce themselves and say a little bit and then we're just going to see how the discussion goes. So I'm Rupert Reed. I'm an eco-philosopher based at the University of East Anglia and I also chair a green think tank called Greenhouse. So I think it's been a fascinating day. My own contribution to the day was to try to focus our attention on the real danger that we face now of out of control climate change and I'm interested in thinking about that from a philosophical perspective. How ought we to be thinking as we look forward to what that means for the kind of future world we could inhabit? So in a nutshell and specifically, my idea is that if we are faced with the possibility of civilizational collapse, and there's a very real danger now that we may be with the advent of dangerous climate change and with us doing far too little to actually stop it from getting out of control, then we need to think about what kind of civilization we may be able to create out of that wreckage in the future. And in particular, I suggested today, and this was an idea we had some discussion of, that we need actually to think about creating a lifeboat civilization or an ark civilization to get us through the really trying times that are going to be coming in the coming generation or two. And hopefully to be able to seed from that a future civilization which would actually be more civil and be more uh, enduring. So thinking about principles, if you will, of civilizational succession uh, to uh, follow up the um, uh, deteriorating situation of the global civilization uh, that we now inhabit. Uh, I'm David Livingston and um, I'm from the Queen's University in Belfast. Uh, my interests um, really have been in geography and in intellectual history. So what I was trying to do today was to look at the history of a pretty ancient idea that um, goes under the label climate determinism. Uh, really the notion that in some vital and important way almost every aspect of human life has been shaped or determined, controlled or whatever by climatic circumstances. This is an ancient idea going back at least to the time of Hippocrates. So I began tracing the history um, of this idea with respect to um, health, with respect to warfare, with respect to economics, um, mental health um, and the like. And then it struck me that there were some resonances uh, between that kind of um, deterministic vocabulary, if you like, and what certain, certain advocates of climate change uh, are thinking that the way climate change will actually direct or shape or channel our futures in pretty certain d directions. Now, what seemed ironic to me is that some of those who have been castigated for an overly deterministic view of climate in the past and who fell into um, uh, disrepute and, I suppose, uh, being disregarded for a long time in the mid-20th century have been resurrected uh, in some of the uh, climate change uh, literature. And I wanted to pursue this intellectual history, uh, not necessarily with the view to uh, issuing a critique, but maybe trying to curb some of our rhetoric and I've begun to think today that perhaps it's right to curb that rhetoric, but I've been challenged to say that perhaps it's not right to curb that rhetoric, especially if it gets the job done of changing attitudes. One of the difficulties, I think, of the history I'm trying to write is that it's very easy for people to think that somehow this means uh, climate change denial when you begin to be critical in any way of modern climatic discourse. And that's certainly not something that I, um, uh, that I share, but by the same token, I think, I think that we have to have some sense of responsibility about the way we are using our rhetoric in a public forum. So it's an intellectual history of ideas about climate and I guess climate change over the long haul and how this is supposed to have shaped our civilization and to have shaped us ourselves. My name's Michael Roos. Um, although, obviously, from my accent, I was born on this side of the Atlantic. I spent all of my academic life, or my grown-up academic life, in North America, and I teach philosophy at Florida State University in Florida. Um, I'm a philosopher, and I think at least half of my fellow philosophers would say, I should not be here. 
that this is not the sort of thing that philosophers do, that philosophy is a much more meta-discipline, much more intellectual, and this sort of thing is best left to geographers and sociologists, dear God, even to educationalists. Um, I I'm proud to be here uh, because I'm a historian and philosopher of science, and I've spent all my life digging around in Darwin. Um, more recently, I've been very interested in the Gaia hypothesis. Uh, having said that, I've spent most of the day in abject or naked panic wondering why in hell I am here. And in particular, what am I going to say tomorrow which is relevant to the concerns, and I, 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 let me say, <coughs> I think important concerns of this group here. And I'm starting to see my way forward a lot more now. I'm starting to see that Gaia, uh, particularly the whole Gaia hypothesis, and apocalyptic or millennial thinking uh, are, are, I won't say different sides of the same coin, but I do see that there's an awful lot there. And so what I'm going to try to do tomorrow, and what I've been thinking about, as it were, in reaction to what I've been listening to today, is particularly uh, the, the basic division of millenarian thinking between those who are post-mill, uh, who think that we've got to create heaven here on earth, or, and those who are, are pre-mill, who think that there's nothing we can do, but we've got to wait until the Redeemer returns. And uh, I, when I say nothing we can do, nothing we can do at that sort of level, there's lots that we can do. And I've been thinking an awful lot about climate change and how one fits climate change into those two basic categories. And uh, I'm starting to think I can kind of see a kind of way forward. I, uh, those of you who know me will, I, I feel I've got a book coming on. <laughs> Uh, I'm Katharina Gerstenberger. I'm the Chair of World Languages and Cultures at the University uh, of Utah. My uh, field of research is contemporary German literature, so I'm going to present tomorrow. And we haven't had any literature presentations yet, so um, that should be interesting. My, my um, sort of basic question and approach is how come, on the one hand, we know ultimately so much about climate change and how come we manage to do so little? And that's, of course, a very big uh, topic. So what I'm interested in is, is, is climate fiction and narrative and the question, how do we tell the story in an effective way to, well, to reach an audience? And I'm not saying that literature necessarily needs to be engaged and needs to preach and needs to, to, to get a reaction, but I think it can serve uh, this function. It can, can raise awareness. It, of course, also has the, the, the ability and task uh, to entertain. So what I'm interested in is, is how do we tell a story? Do we, and we talked about this, or heard about this a little bit, sort of do we use a tragic mode of telling the story? Can we use comedy to get to get uh, the topic across how do we deal with issues of anxiety that I think are more and more real and, 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 and show up um, in literature. And of course, there are also these arguments that the whole topic is just sort of beyond the human capacity to understand because the, 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 the temporal, the spatial dimensions are uh, too big. So, so what I got out of this, this, this afternoon, what I'll talk about tomorrow, and I think where literature actually can do something, sort of bring these, these, various, these various discourses and narratives together. Because I think what we, we, we heard about today is, is history. And I think we need to think about a little bit more sort of how history and the present can be uh, bought, uh, brought together. Obviously, religion was brought up time and again, and I think in, in different ways, actually, and part of very critical uh, discourse. On the other hand, we also had, had papers, or a paper at least, that said um, the religion has a lot to offer and can actually help us move, move forward. I think to me this is sort of one of the burning questions. Um, how can we bring this together? So I hope for more uh, conversation um, today. Of course, sort of the, the, the gap still between science and, and sort of a more um, humanities-oriented discourse. Again, that's something that we see in literature quite a bit because one of the sort of most prevalent characters in literary plot is the scientist who will sort of convey 
a certain uh, message to other figures in the in the novel or to the audience uh, ultimately so 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 my basic question is is communication i feel um we've made a we've we've gotten off to a good start but i think there are also still questions um that are open where we need to continue to think about communication and and how do we create community ultimately that can do something about it Thank you to all four of you there for a um, very interesting positional stance. Now, Katharina's last remarks, um, I should have added, I'm a historian, and one of the things that's got me thinking in this conference is I'm not a futurologist. I'm not somebody who can predict the future. My job is to interpret the past and to try and make that past accessible. Now, one of the interests that historians have is that their subject matter is usually motivated by present-day concerns, and this is something I'm going to put to all the panel. Is there a tension between your scholarship and how you look at the current issues and a tension between how you think the application of your work will actually lead to some form of future outcome? For me, it's about interpreting the past, having an argument with somebody and trying to persuade them to a particular view of the past, but I'm well aware that climate concerns in the past may be interpreted as if this is their strategy in the past for coping with it, is there a strategy we can learn for the future? For all of you, is, is your scholarship rooted in the now or do you have one eye to the future? I'll have a go at starting with that. So being a philosopher, etymologically, it means you're a lover of wisdom. Uh, and philosophers historically spent a lot of time thinking about the meaning of life. Uh, and I think that philosophy has shied away a little from those central aspects of its project in recent uh, generations. And I think we're now being forced to come back to it and face it again. And I think that's been part of what's been at issue here today. People thinking and facing up to those kinds of questions. To touch on the, the material that Katerina was uh, alluding to uh, there, uh, I'm very interested, for example, uh, in the extraordinary success of the film Avatar, which we discussed. Uh, this afternoon. Uh, that's a film which features uh, a kind of deity called Awar, a little bit like uh, Gaia. Uh, and it's a film which kind of suggests that if there's going to be a way of avoiding um, apocalypse, it may involve some kind of uh, attitude of regarding the earth um, as sacred. Uh, these are bold and radical ideas for us today. Of course, for humans in most of their history, they, they weren't so bold or radical, they were more natural. But I think these are the kinds of bold ideas that um, philosophy and other uh, like-minded disciplines have to start to consider today. Because we are faced, I think, with a crisis of meaning and we're faced with a situation where the governing philosophy seems to have led our civilization into severe peril. Yeah, I've thought a lot about, about that question, um, partly because for a long time I was very critical of Whig history and writing history from the present and, and the like. And yet, ironically, while historians have said that for a long time, when you read a piece of historical scholarship, you pretty quickly know that that's a piece of scholarship of its own time. So in some important way, the historian is always located um, geographically, temporally, and, and, and the like. Um, so in the project I'm doing, I'm actually um, trying um, to say, yes, I am writing from the present. I mean, I don't think that it's in a, a way that history has inevitably led to where we are, but I can't deny the questions that I'm seeing um, in, the world, uh, in the world around me. Um, so then this leads to a, a number of interesting um, uh, uh, matters for how you write about the past as a resource for the future. Um, so one of, the, one of the issues, or several of the issues that have emerged today would be one to do with how does one use one's imagination to reconstruct the past and perhaps to, to construct the future. And what's interesting today is I think we've all acknowledged the failure of our imaginations. We all, we, we, we all feel the need to have um, um, a fertile imagination to depict what we think might be the case, and yet we're always dissatisfied with the imaginaries that come up. We had, a, for example, a um, uh, presentation today about uh, movies, and yet I think many of us felt those movies have not really been able to capture what we're trying to say. Someone else thought that we might sort of introduce the notion of monsters as a possibility. I can see as many dangers in that analogy as, as anything else. So there's an issue about imagination. I think also there's an issue about the history of the tropes that we're using. Apocalypse has dominated uh, much of the conversation today. But Jeremiads have a history. Mostly they haven't been very successful. 
Um, so that you get to the stage of wondering, will another Jeremiah motivate people any more than Jeremiah's have in the past? Maybe there were successful ones. Should we attend to those? But thinking about the kind of analogies or tropes that we have at hand, I think we can benefit a little bit by looking at, the, at how those have been used in the past. And I think the other things about rhetoric, historians always use rhetoric. They use images, they use analogies uh, and the like, and they're born of one's own, uh, one's own time. What rhetoric should practitioners of, the, of futurology or predictors or prophets, if you like, um, of the future um, try to use that will be um, socially responsible, but also, I suppose, politically motivating. And it's, it, it's trying to find a way to negotiate that. And as I said, some people, and I think Rupert may be among them, who, who might say, well, let's not worry too much about the niceties of rhetoric as long as we get people to actually change. I think that's a topic up for discussion rather than for saying we've got a definite answer to it. Um, yes, I, it, it's a question that you, you posed that I've been thinking about sort of generally and, and also today. <clears throat> On the one hand, I am the kind of philosopher or the kind of scholar who's very keen to get involved uh, at some kind of practical level. And I think, uh, if I'm just being modest, I've spent a lot of time uh, working on the evolution-creationism dispute. And that, on one occasion, for instance, led me to be an, an expert witness for the ACLU in a court case. So, obviously, at one level, I feel very strongly that I, as a scholar, I, I feel very strongly that I, as a philosopher, <coughs> excuse me, have something to offer, and I, I want to offer it. So that, that's the one side. On the other hand, somebody, whether it was you, David, or somebody was, was talking earlier on today and saying, you just can't get a grant anymore unless you've got some practical end to it at the end, that you're going to solve global warming or uh, the, you know, you're the answer to what's going on in Syria or something like that. And I have to say that scares the hell out of me because... Uh, I don't want to go into my projects with some kind of artificial, not entirely sincere uh, aim that I put in in order to get, at, get NSF money or what it might be. Uh, I could well see, maybe this is the difference, I could well see somebody who was in a more practical area saying, I have these sorts of issues, I think these are big things, and I as a geographer or sociologist or maybe organic chemist or something like that can actually offer something here, and that's what I want to do, and that's fine. Uh, you know, being a philosopher or a historian, it isn't quite that simple, and I don't want it to be. So as I say, I think we've got a tension here, and I'm not, I, I haven't resolved it at one sort of level. I mean, I've got the luxury of, I've got grant money that I don't have to tell people what I'm going to use it for. So, you know, I, I, I'm a hypocrite. I've got it coming and going like that. But I think it's a big ten. I think it's an important issue for those of us in the humanities. I think, on the one hand, both practically and philosophically, I think that those of us in the humanities, not all of us, but those of us who can should be making a contribution to the general welfare as people like John Stuart Mill did, for instance, or, or John Locke, or, or people like that. So we've got real obligations. On the other hand, you know, it, John Locke didn't solve the Civil War problem and didn't write Grant saying, I think I can deal with the Roundheads versus Cavaliers, and this is, you know, give me money to do this. And so, as I say, it, there's a tension there, and I'm not sure it's resolved or prospects of resolving at the moment. Yeah, I mean, as a literature scholar, um, of course, I, also, I don't necessarily expect to <laughs> solve the problems of the world, but w what I do, of course, do is, is, is as David just said, ver pay, pay very close attention to language, to rhetoric, to, to images, to imaginary sort of how are things being expressed both in the present and historically. I think it's, it's always important to know where something comes from if you want to understand where it is in the present. I mean, that's where things like genre or generic conventions come, come in because, I mean, narrative just doesn't come out of the blue. It has traditions, which I think is very uh, important to, um, to understand, certainly. When I work with uh, students, I tell them, don't tell me what you think 
the author should have written, what kind of story he or she should have told, but let's look at the stories that are there and, and let's come up with as sophisticated readings as we possibly can. And I try to do the same in my in in my my scholarship. And and of course that's where sort of the more political aspect comes in that I choose certain texts that I look at that, that have to do with environmental issues, the picture of nature of nature over time, um, um, climate change, etc. So that's where a political dimension uh, comes in and, and a future dimension at the same time. Of course, in literature studies, and I think in literature itself, we see certain developments. I mean, sort of, I think the pendulum goes back and forth. Should literature be politically engaged or not? And obviously, if you look at climate change, um, that is a form of political uh, engagement. I think what we see in sort of more recent literature is that actually political um, engagement on the part of writers come back, that more people sort of... Um, focus on these issues and I think this is where I come in as a as a scholar to 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 point to draw attention to this and to point out constructive readings and interpretations of these of these texts and sort of help students myself interested people sort of to come up with scenarios um, 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 imagination that actually addresses, because I think fantasy imagination is very important here actually as we sort of project into the future, that, that helps us sort of make this come alive and concrete and then actionable ultimately. Thank you. Um, I'm aware that time is short and so I'm going to ask each of you to conclude with some final thoughts and if you have First of all, a sense of where your discipline is going in relation to the topic of climate and this loaded word of apocalypse. And secondly, if you have anything that you might want to say about action that you think might be necessary in your field or interventions, that a direction that you would like the field to go in relation to where you think it's going. Well, um, I'll say that I think that it's very difficult for anybody, um, philosophers or anybody else, to face up to the climate reality that we are now facing, which is um, uh, unprecedented uh, and grim and at the same time kind of evanescent and slightly unbelievable uh, that it could really be uh, as bad as I'm afraid it is uh, likely to be. So I think there is a huge task here of uh, facing up to this reality together. And I think we did a little bit of that here today, which I found quite um, encouraging, uh, actually. Uh, felt a little bit of kind of um, mutual understanding in the room and a willingness to overcome the kind of soft denial that I think saturates so much of our lives, including in the intellectual world. You know, it's very easy to look at someone like Donald Trump and say, you know, what an idiot for being a climate change denier. But it seems to me that at a, at a subtler level, virtually all of us, virtually all the time, are kind of in denial about how bad things are and how we are um, involved in institutions and practices that perpetuate that. So that's what I hope, that we will carry on from here uh, the task of um, uh, seeking to face up to that reality and change accordingly. And now I'm afraid I must go and leave the others to, to make their own uh, conclusions without me. Thanks for bringing me up. Do well, you run him down first or am I? <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. Well, from a disciplinary point of view, which is where I think you, you began here, um, um, trying to live in two worlds of intellectual history and um, geography, I've seen my task as trying to hold these two together. Now, interestingly, there are climate change scientists within the geographical community who are working on uh, paleoenvironments, uh, climate change in the past, and also modeling for the future and so on. And then there are intellectual historians like myself who work on the history of ideas about climate, uh, the social construction of communities that deal with um, meteorolo meteorology and the like. And I think that these two communities have not talked very much together. So it's as though the futurists and the historians are doing two entirely different uh, tasks. And one can see a kind of intellectual justification for it in some ways. The, studying the future seems a bit different from studying the past. Yet I think there would be greater fertility if there was some kind of overlay between these. For example, climate modeling, 
For the future, can climate modelers learn about the history of climate modeling, the kind of um, issues that go into the making of a climate model that might be instructive um, and so forth? For me personally, one of the things that's arisen today is the stunning range of religious vocabulary that seems to be at the heart of thinking about, about climate and climate change. Um, not only did we have a paper talking about um, climate and providentialism in the, in the colonization of the Americas there, uh, for example, but a apocalypse itself and eschatology are hugely loaded uh, religious uh, uh, vocabularies. And I think you could add to this concepts like um, climate indulgences I've heard about, um, climate heaven or climate hell, um, the notion that the climate might be punishing us for behaving in ways that are irresponsible um, and so on. So I guess I just think that for me... Can I frame one more? Eco-sins. Yeah. Eco-sins, Eco -sins, yeah, exactly. I think there's a whole range of this vocabulary. Is it purely strategic? Is it instrumental? Is it ornamental? Or does it do something more? Is there something to be learned from trying to do a history of these two seemingly entirely different traditions that seem to be merging in some significant way as we face an undeniable human crisis bringing these things to the surface again? So that's something I'll take away from today. I, I, I'm kind of sorry that Rupert has left because at a certain level I want to take issue uh, with him. One thing which has come across to me very much today is that the job of people like David and myself at one level is not to make judgments, at least at that level. I worry that so much of the stuff which is written either by philosophers or particularly by historians of science is they're trying to root out the baddies, uh, that they're trying to show that somebody is in the pay of some you know, oil company or something like that, or whatever it might be, or work for Reagan and they've got these kinds of views. And of course, often that's true. But you mentioned religion, uh, David. Think of how many of my fellow philosophers would immediately want to condemn anybody who uses a religious trope or something like that. Now, I wanna say, let's show them that they're doing this but not necessarily say, well, because you're doing this, it's therefore wrong, even if you're not a Christian. Uh, what I want to say is I think that it's very important that there be some of us, like you and me, uh, who, yeah, we, we wouldn't be doing this if we didn't care hugely about it, but at some level, you know, we've got to be able to listen to Theresa May as well as Jeremy Corbyn. And, you know, we've got to take their arguments seriously, at least at the level of saying, why would grown-up intelligent people want to take this sort of position, one which may be entirely alien to me. And I think unless some of us can do that sort of thing and reach across, it doesn't mean to say that you have to agree with it. And of course, it's a big problem. It's nothing like writing on the Nazis. How the hell can you write on the Nazis if you've got to empathize with Heinrich Himmler? I don't know how you do it. And, and there were scholars like Fackenheim uh, who said, no, you can't, you shouldn't do it. But at, I think at this level, dealing with climate Climate change. We're in it, folks. We can't, you know, we can't get off the boat. And I think it does behove at least some of us. I'm not saying all of us to try to keep that level of objectivity, which does not mean non-judgmental. It does not mean indifferent, which often people mean by that. But at least able to have an empathy across the across the, the barriers, because I think that's terribly important that some of us do that. Yeah, thank you. I like the state of this empathy across the barriers. I think is a very uh, important statement. That's, of course, also something that literature can do, right? I mean, liter writers, authors put before us worlds, I mean, carefully crafted and constructed, sort of uh, contingent, obviously limited, but at the same time can do a number of things and precisely sort of have dialogue ac a num uh, ac across a number of, of, of different 
subject positions, right? Human or even non-human, some people suggest. So in, 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 in literature as well as literature studies, climate fiction is, is, is relatively new still. So I think film probably interestingly is, is, is more advanced, has more examples out there than literature. But I think writers have discovered the topic. So I'm hopeful that more uh, interesting, compelling works ca will come out. And then of course my community can 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 in, interpret these because I think what we need is is new stories, new ways of communicating, and I think this is where literature can really come in and 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 help move this dialogue forward across various barriers and to try things 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 out conceptually. So so I um, as I said today I was looking for and I think I was beginning to see them. Um, connections precisely so across disciplines across various uh, positions so um, I got some 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 good ideas here I very much hope that we'll go and I'm sure we will continue this tomorrow because to, to me what's 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 absolutely crucial is is with sort of to talk across various whether it's disciplines, positions, um, cultures, religions, and we talk about civil and civilization certainly in the plural to 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 understand. I mean, we all are in this together, right? But I think it's very very hard for us to actually get this message. And I think today we made a little progress towards that. Actually, this in this together feeling. So. Well, being all in this together and talking to each other, I'd like to thank all of our contributors, Rupert, who's now gone, David, Michael and Katerina. And thank you for watching. It's goodbye from me, Ariel Hessian. <laughs>